A reading from the first letter of St. John. Children, it is the last hour, and just as you heard that the Antichrist was coming, so now many Antichrists have appeared. Thus we know this is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not really of our number. If they had been, they would have remained with us. Their desertion shows that none of them was of our number. But you have the anointing that comes from the Holy One, and you have all knowledge. I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you do, and because every lie is alien to the truth. Verbum Domini. Dominus Vobiscum, Lexio Sancti Evangelii Secundum Ioannem, Gloria 
In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came to be through him, and without him nothing came to be. What came to be through him was life, and this life was the light of the human race. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. A man named John was sent from God. He came for testimony to testify to the light, so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to testify to the light. The true light which enlightens everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world came to be through him, but the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, but his own people did not accept him. But to those who did accept him, he, came, he gave power to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of natural generation, nor by human choice, nor by a man's decision, but of God. And the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us, and we saw his glory, the glory of the Father's only begotten Son, full of grace and truth. John testified to him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, The one who is coming after me ranks ahead of me, because he existed before me. From his fullness we have all received grace in place of grace. Because while the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God the only begotten Son, God, who is at the Father's right hand, has revealed him. Verbum Domini. We have these two texts of scripture, both written by St. John the Apostle and Evangelist, which kind of clash with each other if you set them against one another. In the, his first letter, he begins here today by saying, children, it is the last hour. And then he says a little bit later, thus we know this is the last hour. And yet in the gospel, he begins, in this beautiful prologue of John's Gospel, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And so in the first reading, we have this focus of our attention on the fact that it's the end, it's over, it's done. And then we get to the Gospel and we have, it's just the beginning, you know? And that is uh, what we're reminded of in this Christmas season so vividly that uh, in our mortality, in our life in this world, this has come to an end because of the coming of Christ. Uh, sin, suffering, and death are at the end because we are invited to assume the immortality or the immortal nature of Christ who has been from the beginning exists for all time. He assumed our mortality, a share in our mortality, so that we could participate and have a share in his immortality. That we could uh, transcend this world, this time and the limitations of space, and enter into and participate in his life of grace, his eternal life. And this is the great exchange that is made in the incarnation, that God has become man so that man can become God. And this is uh, such a beautiful gift that we've received in Christmas. 
I'd like to look at that here on the seventh day in the octave of Christmas where we still wish one another Merry Christmas. Uh, even if you go to the stores and everything from Christmas is on the, the giveaway or sale table, and it's all just relegated to the garbage heap, you might say, and you pick through the Christmas lights that you're going to put up next year, the garland that's marked 50% uh, down, but on the shelves is Valentine's Day is already out. You know, don't get into that mentality as a Christian. We need to keep alive uh, our celebration of Christmas. Today is still Christmas. For the eight days of the octave, we celebrate it as if today, this day, is Christmas Day. Such a gift cannot be contained within 24 hours of man. And we have a sense of this eternity. Now, if you look at the Valentines that are out there, you might think in terms of Christmas, well, it speaks to us of love. And that is what the coming of the Word made flesh speaks to us of, the love of God. And isn't it true that when we encounter love in our life, it does seem like life just begins? You know, it doesn't matter even if you fall in love when you're my age, 43, that you can say, ah, life is just beginning. You know, this is what happens to us, the thrill of love. And so with the coming of uh, Jesus, what happened to God's people is that our hearts were filled with this thrill, this excitement, this sense of it's just beginning, or we have a new beginning, or we're be being created once again, or recreated in Christ, because our bridegroom has come. The one that we've been waiting for has come to wed himself to us. This is the, the thrill of the church as we enter into that participation of his life, he who existed from the beginning. But to look at this uh, again in the light of St. Francis of Assisi, we know that he played an integral role in our, uh, the very existence of the Christmas crib that we find in our churches and in our homes. I hope you, again, haven't packed those up yet. If you've gotten your Valentine's already, well, just set it next to the Christmas crib and remind yourself of that love of God. But we're told that in a famous work entitled The Legend of Perugia, uh, the early followers of St. Francis, those who lived with him, uh, said and pointed out that St. Francis had a greater respect for the solemnity of Christmas than for the other feasts of the Lord. And St. Francis would say that our salvation is affected in the other feasts as we remember the passion of Christ, as we remember his resurrection and his ascension. These things that are these events, these mysteries which affected our salvation. He said, that's what we recall in these other feasts. But he said that from the day our Savior was born, it became certain for us that we would be saved. And this is what thrilled the heart of St. Francis. That with the coming of Christ, it, was, it became certain for us that we would be saved. And so he wanted every Christian to exult in the Lord and for love of him who gave us the gift of himself. And uh, the way that he asked for us to do this is how we celebrate Christmas, plus something rather unique that most of us are not used to. He said that for us to exult in the Lord who gave himself to us as this gift, that Christians should joyfully give handsome presents to the poor. And not only to the poor, but also to give extra gifts to the domestic animals and the birds. Now, I think this is partly where we get St. Francis in our backyards and just associating him with the birds. But he loved the birds, especially the larks, who would come and sing the praises of God and even on the eve of his death came and flew low 
around the building where he was lying. And he heard their voices, their, their song of praise. But he wished, his the early followers tell us, that he wished to, if he could have told all of the leaders of the cities and all of the lords of the castles and villages that they ought to oblige their subjects every, every year on the day of the nativity to throw wheat or other grain on the road outside of the cities and towns so that on this great solemnity of Christmas, the birds and especially our sisters, the larks, would have food. Now, can you imagine that? Maybe try to do that uh, on this seventh and tomorrow the eighth day of the octave to say, well, okay, I'm going to get a little bird seed. I'm going to throw it out there for them as an extra little gift for those who praise God. And he also asked, and this is what we are used to, he also asked that out of respect for the Son of God, that on Christmas the statue of the Blessed Virgin Mary would be placed at the manger between the ox and the ass, and that everyone be obliged to give our brothers, the oxen and the asses, a generous amount of feed. And he encouraged uh, everyone to invite the poor to their homes for a lavish meal. And so it's important for us in light of this also to point out that at Greccio, where St. Francis first called for that living reenactment of Bethlehem to be set up, where he had the live animals, where he gathered the townspeople uh, to commemorate and relive the cave in Bethlehem, where he, what he placed over the place where the divine child would lay is he had a small altar erected there where the mass would be offered. And we know that on that Christmas night, they tell us that St. Francis chanted the gospel uh, to recount the nativity. But it's very fitting because St. Francis taught his followers, taught all of us, he says it beautifully in his admonitions, that it was the same, it is the same faith that was needed to recognize that this was God. He would say for the followers of Jesus to look at this man, someone who looked just like me, or just like you, that it took faith to believe that this was God, for he truly was God. It's that faith that is required of us to kneel like the shepherds, to bow down like the kings in the cave of Bethlehem. They recognized by faith who Jesus was, that this was the Son of God made incarnate. And St. Francis would say that it requires the same eyes of faith for us those same eyes of faith are needed to recognize the presence of God in our midst today under the appearances of bread and wine in the Holy Eucharist. And so he made this correlation there at Greccio, that as we look at the Christ child in the crib, we recognize this is the faith that I must have to recognize that this is God and I look at the altar, and there's a direct link that the Lord uh, veils himself, the true and living God, veils himself under those thin uh, appearances of bread and wine, and that this is truly uh, the real presence of Jesus Christ, who took flesh from the Virgin Mary, who preached the gospel on this earth, who suffered and died for us on the cross, who rose again from the dead and sits at the right hand of his Father. You know, for us to have this faith, we do the same thing that the angels did. We sing out in praise. We do the same thing that the shepherds did. We go to behold this and to gaze upon him. And we come like the wise men, like the kings, and we kneel down and give everything that we possess to him. 
we hand ourselves over to him in faith. So I'd simply encourage all of us on the seventh day in the octave to keep the spirit of Christmas alive, not only in our hearts, but also in our homes. There are a number of families that we know who uh, practice the 12 days of Christmas. So from Christmas Day all the way to Epiphany on January 6th, they give a little gift. It doesn't have to be a big expensive thing, but each day they've made arrangements to have a little gift to open up. And this is especially important for children to recognize, okay, Christ manifested himself at the on Christmas Day, but he also had this revelation of himself to the Gentiles on Epiphany. And so the Epiphany is really the day for all of us to enter into this revelation of God who became man. And to keep alive this, uh, not only the octave, but the season of Christmas, that we receive these little gifts to remind us of the real gift that we've received. Our sisters in France wrote in their newsletter for Christmas that Jesus is the gift that keeps on giving. That we keep opening up this gift of, uh, of Christ and we come to see him more and more and more as we uh, pray and live in our relationship with him. You know, it's not fruitcake that is the gift that keeps on giving. It's Jesus who is that gift that keeps on giving us grace upon grace upon grace. And so to uh, maybe have a practice like that in our homes, we continue to open a gift and say, when will it stop? Because we participate already in what eternity is like. That goodness never stops. Um, another practice is to have the three kings with your a little crib scene in your home. Move the little kings a little bit closer each day now as we draw closer to uh, Epiphany. My twin sister is visiting for Christmas. She pointed this out. Her uh, third child, uh, John Paul, who's in fourth grade, we were walking up to the guest house and she said, look at that. We looked in the window and they had these little uh, nativity figurines that were made for children. You know, they're very, they look like Charlie Brown figures. But I could see the outline of three little teeny tiny things sitting in the window, and I said, well, what is that? And she said, it's the three wise men looking for the star. You know, this is the innocence of children. And I laughed when I walked in the living room, and there's these three little figures, not looking into the house, but standing there facing out the window, you know. And do we look out the window and look for that star which will lead us to Christ? You know, Christmas is such a, a season of these uh, vivid little things to be like children uh, in that affectionate relationship with the Lord. I encourage you to follow the invitation or the exhortation of St. Francis and to invite someone who is less fortunate to your home for a meal. If that doesn't happen on Christmas Day, it can happen throughout the octave or throughout the Christmas season. It doesn't have to be, you know, all the fixings. Maybe reach out to someone that you know who is alone or who, as I said, is less fortunate or poor, who is without a family, Invite them for a cup of coffee at McDonald's and to recognize this is how I can reach out and encounter Christ who came among us as one who is poor. Can I visit someone in a nursing home and share with them this spirit, this gift of Christmas? And the final thing to visit our churches, especially with our little children, Bring them to your church to just look at the nativity scene. And little children are totally mesmerized so often by this. To look at the baby Jesus and to look at all of these little figures and to see all of these people, these statues are always 
designed in a way to be bent down or kneeling on their knee, and then to help them recognize that in the tabernacle is the real living presence of Jesus. And just like we come, like those shepherds and like those kings, like St. Joseph and like our Blessed Mother, in awe of this mystery, in total veneration, in total adoration, that this is how we're to enter our churches. And this is the reverence that we are to show to the real presence of Jesus, who always dwells here on our altars.